Okay, folks, thank you all for coming out to the July 2021 event for the Atlanta Kubernetes Meetup. Uh, as always, I want to say thank you for joining us. And I know everybody's sick and tired of doing Zoom at this point. So we appreciate you putting up with a little bit more of it for us. Uh, we have some great content tonight. I promise we'll uh, do our best, best to uh, make it worth it. Um, so uh, I want to start off as we always do with a call for hiring in the community. If you or someone in your organization is hiring for a role in the Kubernetes cloud native space, um, go ahead and post in the chat. And after the news, I'll read those announcements out loud and also post them along with the show notes. Um, make sure to include information about uh, the role and who they can contact if they're interested. Um, I happen to know that several people have found roles through this, uh, this announcement uh, at this point. So don't discount it, definitely share them. Uh, and with that, I will go, go ahead and hand over to Joe for the news. Share my screen again here. And if I could get a thumbs up from someone. All right, cool. Bump this up a little bit more, make it easy for folks to read. So, going through, starting off with our normal kind of status of the Kubernetes release cycle for the current release, um, which is Kubernetes version 1.22. Um, we had the first release candidate um, that was cut out um, earlier uh, within the past couple of weeks, I think. Um, and we're getting pretty close. Documentation deadline has come and passed. Um, there's just a handful of remaining uh, tests and, and flakes that are being sorted out by the release team and some of the community members right now. But we're really, really close and currently targeting uh, August 4th for the uh, release for 1.22. We did have um, some fixed releases with um, Kubernetes 121.3, 120.9, and 119.13. And with this fixed release, that bumped 1.18 off. So 1.18 is out of the community support at this point. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more uh, about that. So um, while there were, don't mistake the NAs here for the promotions and deprecations, there definitely were promotions and deprecations within the project. Uh, there just weren't any that um, seemed uh, um, big enough to call out here, but we did have a CVE that came up um, that prompted these fixed releases here. And so this CVE was around endpoint and endpoint slice permissions um, to allow for cross namespace forwarding um, there's a lot of nitty gritty details here in this, but essentially, if you're running Kubernetes and you have um, users have access to create um, for the endpoints, endpoint slices, APIs, um, you are vulnerable here. Um, so there's not currently, I don't think there's currently a major fix for this yet, but there's some information here on the detection and some things that you can do to sort of work around this, but the major recommendation is to sort of remove right access to end users from the endpoints and endpoint slices API here. Um, and we do have additional links in the notes here for the CVs tracked from both kind of a, a, a Red Hat derivative perspective and a Debian derivative perspective. Um, and then we'll jump into the community news section. So uh, Contributor Summit North America 2021, the planning for this has begun. They've got some information up on a website here that's linked to in the notes. Um, I think there are uh, some requests for feedback on a couple of things. Uh, and this is going to be a um, hybrid event. So it'll be both in person and virtual as of right now. And um, there's going to be sort of a, a kind of change to an unconference style uh, session format, um, providing um, a, a little bit different format than we've had in the past, but um, looking forward to this. Registration is not open yet, but keep an eye on that page for when it does open. Highly recommend um, whether you've ever been to KubeCon or not, if you plan on joining KubeCon this year. Um, me personally, this is one of the events that I look forward to the most. Um, in addition to, you know, the general networking and, and meeting some of the folks behind the core pieces of the Kubernetes project, there's lots of good information on how to get started with contributing, whether that's code level contributions or um, contributions to documentation, things like that. Um, and then a lot of information on how to um, take, you know, get into the process of 
making an enhancement to Kubernetes through the CAP process, testing that locally, um, and then driving the contribution forward in the community. So highly recommend this, very cool experience. Um, another thing to call out is Linkerd got a diploma. So Linkerd passed graduation in the C CNCF. Um, huge congratulations to that entire team. Um, they've done a lot of work over the years to really establish their documentation, their tooling, the ecosystem, um, and their user base. So huge shout out. Another kind of fun thing, if you've been around the Kubernetes community for a while, if you've ever opened a PR, an issue, or, or done a commit against the project, you've probably noticed a little bot account called uh, the Fetchda bot. Um, that has uh, came from Eric Fetchda, one of the longtime contributors to the Kubernetes project. Um, that bot is being retired, uh, and uh, the KH triage robot is the new bot that Essentially, all the same functionality, just new, new, new coat of paint on it and whatnot. Um, but uh, long, long live uh, the cage triage bot there. And there's a, it's a really, really cool um, kind of fun background. If you're not familiar with it, uh, I won't go into all the details here. But um, some of the fun shenanigans that are sprinkled around and throughout the Kubernetes project with things like this, where um, you know somebody opens an, an issue. Uh, because the Fetcher bot couldn't admit that it was an automated computer program and uh, a lot of the uh, shenanigans that ensued after that. So really fun read. If you want a good laugh, check it out. Um, so there was a proposal to use a, uh, a DAG or distributed acyclic graph for the sidecar container dependencies. This was a really interesting one. So the sidecar primitive for Kubernetes has been bouncing around for, for a little while now. Um, and there's been some sort of reference implementations that were like included and then pulled back. And there's been a lot of planning around this. And there's a lot of complexity here um, to solve some of the existing problems that came about with, you know, running multiple containers on the pod already. How do you control a dependency model of which, which containers start up first and what happens when they shut down and different things like that. So this is a really cool design doc document um, covering the proposal of how to cover all that stuff. It's a really nice model. Um, if you're interested in that sort of thing, go check it out. I think they're looking for like final round of feedback and stuff before this stuff all gets into a plan for, for making it into Kubernetes. Um, another security thing to call out here, um, if you're a Helm user and you have any type of Helm repository, um, definitely something you want to pay attention to here. Um, and I don't know all the ins and outs of this, but essentially when a Helm repository is defined, there's kind of two different um, endpoints that can be referenced in there. And there's some uh, things with credential leaking to where um, uh, using the, the repository can end up sending credentials to an endpoint that's unanticipated by the end user. So um, I think they do have a fix for this and, and a way or workarounds for this where you can kind of inspect and see if you're vulnerable here. but. If you're using any sort of like custom um, uh, Helm repositories and things like that, def definitely something to check out. Um, there's this item here for running containers and separate mount namespaces. Uh, so this is interesting, kind of furthering on a lot of the work that's been done over the past couple of years in the Kubernetes uh, community to um, just further enhance the security of the project and the model for all the underlying components that make Kubernetes tick. Um, this is where um, today, I think, and hopefully I don't butcher this, when, when you have a, a mount volume for, for a pod or a container, there's some, it ties back to a path on the local uh, worker nodes file system and whatnot, and that's in a shared um, file system namespace on the underlying node uh, for all of the pods there. Um, and in this model, it basically ends up creating a separate sort of uh, mount namespace on the underlying worker node for each um, uh, each pod here. So you get a further level of isolation and whatnot, further enhances the security model in this. Um, and uh, the brief read through that I did, I think it sort of addresses some past, um, some issues where there were CVEs discovered with like sort of uh, a high level of nested mounts and whatnot. This would have resolved that out of the box, which is really cool. Um, and I think it solves some other scalability concerns that have come up in the past around how this is managed um, uh, traditionally in the Kubernetes stack. Uh, 
this is another big one to call out. Kubernetes release cadence change. So last year with everything going on with the pandemic and whatnot, there were only three Kubernetes releases that came out. And there's been a lot of discussion around the model of is, is three releases better or worse? How does that fit in? How does that affect delivery of new enhancements and features? How does that affect um, uh, upstream or downstream providers that build like managed Kubernetes services? What's their timeline to react to different changes as, as new versions come out? And then I think anybody that's been running Kubernetes for a while in a big enterprise, you know, falls into the same thing with any type of software is how do we keep this up to date when it changes so frequently and so fast and everything. So um, there's been a lot of evaluation and discussion on what works best and going forward, there's going to, this model will be three releases per year. Um, and this is really cool too, because there's, there's a lot of people that work on the Kubernetes release teams that put in a lot of awesome work um, and they haven't previously had like kind of dedicated blocked out time to like do things like attend KubeCon and, and, and different things like that. So this accounts for that as well. Um, so hopefully this isn't quite the Kubernetes long-term support thing that was, was being uh, talked about in years past, but um, hopefully we'll see um, changes come less frequently, um, but be more, have more stability behind it. So definitely an interesting thing. Um, and then I, I came across this little project with the Sysbox container runtime. So this was pretty interesting. I've seen a couple things in a similar space to this in the past, but this one had a really nice spin on it. But essentially, this is like a um, a Run C compliant container runtime um, that uh, allows you allows for some further levels of isolation um, to sort of treat containers more like virtual machines in in some ways um, and. All of this is sort of done transparently under the cover. So things like Kubernetes and higher level orchestrators like still compatible with it and whatnot. Um, and it's as easy as like using all your existing Docker tooling, but just specifying a different um, runtime here. Um, so pretty cool. There's some demo videos and, and stuff like that. But if that stuff's interesting to you, definitely check it out. Um, yet another vulnerability that came out in the past couple of weeks. Um, so this one was centered around um, the Argo stack. Um, so if you're using the Argo stuff, um, definitely want to take a look and pay attention to this. Essentially, there's some pieces within the Argo stack that could potentially be exposed and allow for um, like a runtime execution type thing and the popular uh, attack vector seems to be people deploying crypto miners to people's Kubernetes clusters through this. So um, Argo is pretty popular. Uh, so it's a it's a it's it's a good attack vector, but uh, definitely take a look at that and and patch up um, if you're vulnerable to that. Um, the CNCF put out a white paper on uh, Kubernetes operators, which is pretty interesting. Um, so this is a very huge document. It's very in-depth. It sort of examines a lot of the different, um, it breaks down the core components of what is a Kubernetes operator, breaks down all of the different tooling that's available as far as like frameworks like the operator SDK or Cube Builder um, and, and, and a handful of others. And then goes through some different scenarios of like helping you decide which tool to pick, you know, based on what you're trying to solve with the pattern um, and then a lot of other work kind of leading towards like emerging patterns and future work in this space. So really, really cool information. If you're building operators and controllers for Kubernetes or you're thinking about building operators and controllers for Kubernetes, really good resource. Um, this is another fun little project that I came across that um, in the same way that you have stuff like the operator SDK and Cube Builder, where there's some functionality um, that's mainly geared towards like building Kubernetes controllers and operators. There's some functionality in like say Cube Builder to um, add a dynamic admission controller to your um, Kubernetes operator. But this uh, framework admission control, um, they call themselves a micro framework for Kubernetes, is basically a really, really small framework that um, defines some primitives for bootstrapping Kubernetes admission controllers, whether it be a validating admission controller or a mutating admission controller. 
Um, and so they've got some examples and different things here that, that it goes through, but um, rather than in the same way that the, the um, cube builder, you know, solves a lot of the underlying controller runtime patterns and things for you, for an operator, this does some similar things for the um, dynamic emission controllers. And then we have the crustlet, which is fun. So I think this is up for proposal in the CNCF, uh, CNCF sandbox. Um, but a simple, essentially, this is um, taking the, the um, Kubernetes kubelet pattern, um, and it's an implementation in Rust, but geared towards executing um, code within the WebAssembly model. Um, so very, very interesting collection of technologies to sort of show that, hey, we can do more things with the Kubernetes kubelet pattern than just what it does today and what most people associate with it. B, the large majority of tooling and things in the ecosystem for Kubernetes is mostly Golang based. So this brings a new like kind of tangible example of things you can do with Rust and, and whatnot. Um, and then sprinkle in some web assembly in here, just you know, add even more magic to it all. So really interesting thing. Um, check that out if you're interested in that sort of stuff. And with that, that wraps up this month in Kubernetes news. So I'll turn it back over to you, Alex. All right, we've got some great activity for hiring. Let me just read these out. Looks like uh, Suse is hiring. Um, Mr. Nick Garris, I probably apologize if I got the, uh, pronunciation wrong there. It says you can email him at nick.garris at suse.com if you're interested in working for them. Um, so uh, with these emails, I'll read them, but just check the chat. You should see them there. They'll also be in the uh, show notes as well uh, for those seeing this in recording. Uh, VMware's Tanzu Group is hiring solution engineers in both Atlanta and Florida. Uh, there's links for both of those. You can also email makrishna at vmware.com. Uh, SpeedScale is a local Atlanta startup hiring for front end, back end, and everything in between. I'm not sure what's in between. I'm really curious. Uh, <laughs> uh, they say they are heavy on Kubernetes, Golang, gRPC, and all the latest and greatest toys. Uh, you can give uh, Matt Larray a shout at matt at speedscale.com. Uh, and then Upbound is also hiring. I guess uh, since you're on a, a hot mic already, Dan, you want to take a second and uh, shout that out? Yeah, absolutely. So I. I work at Upbound, um, and we are the creators of the Crossplane project. Um, and Upbound Cloud is kind of like a managed service around that, which I'm sure uh, I'd be happy. And, and others who are who are in the audience, I see, would be happy to talk to you about that as well. But we are hiring um, kind of uh, across the stack. So if you're interested in working on open source, you're interested uh, on building a a hosted Crossplane offering, uh, definitely feel free to reach out uh, to me directly, uh, Dan at Upbound.io or at hash Dan on Twitter. Nice, some very cool stuff going on there. It's not, a, not an opportunity you want to sleep on if you're interested. Uh, and then Mr. Duffy Cooley also posted. Duffy, you got a mic? You want to give a shout real quick? Sure. We're hiring at Isovalent. We're actually going to market for um, with Cilium and uh, some of the enterprise products that we've built on top. You're going to learn more about them today. If you want to hear more, uh, check out the link or just email me, dcooley at isovalent.com or at Maui Lion anywhere. There you go. Again, another really great organization doing very cool things. You do not want to sleep on that. If you're interested at all, definitely take advantage of that, folks. Um, all right, so before we move on, I want to say thank you to our sponsor, SalesLoft, as always, for you know providing us uh, the Zoom webinar and things like that, and in better times, providing us fun things like pizza and beer. We're all looking forward to taking advantage of those again, I'm sure, in the future. Um, so during the presentation, questions can be asked using the Q&A feature, um, and uh, Joe and myself will uh, pause the presenter and ask them at an appropriate time. Just feel free to, to put them in there as, as uh, things go on, and we'll make sure they get answered. Uh, and with that, we're going to go ahead and kick off. Uh, we are starting off with uh, Mr. Dan Mangum here. He's the maintainer of Crossplane and a senior software engineer at Upbound, as he mentioned a moment ago. And he's going to be telling us about day two operations on Crossplane. Awesome. Thanks for that intro. Let me go ahead and share my screen here and we can get started. All right, so uh, my name is Dan Mangum, as was mentioned, and uh, I am a maintainer of the Crossplane. Uh, project. And I know I, I had written this beforehand that I wanted to make sure to say this, but uh, I appreciated it already being mentioned. Uh, 
Um, but I'll say it again. Um, I really appreciate the folks who are on the call today because I know over the past year and a half, we've kind of started to have some fatigue with virtual events. So uh, I'm definitely honored uh, that folks showed up to uh, hear me hear me go on about Crossplane and, and some of the things that we're excited about in the future of Crossplane. Um, and I'm really grateful to be here. So thank you uh, for showing up. Uh, I'll also warn you, uh, I do like to pack a lot of information into the talks that I give. Uh, my philosophy is kind of, uh, I'll give you the kitchen sink, and I'm very open to folks uh, reaching out afterwards. So that's what we're going to do today. And we're actually going to be uh, going into some parts of Crossplane that don't yet exist, uh, but it's where we're going directionally. Uh, and I'm hoping to actually get folks feedback on that. Uh, I've definitely heard um, kind of uh, through the grapevine that uh, that this is definitely a, a sophisticated audience at the Kubernetes Atlanta meetup. Uh, so I thought I'd uh, I'd give you my best stuff. Um, so with that, let's go ahead and and jump into it. Sneak peek, All right. <laughs> so uh, because we are going to have a lot of content today, here's a brief overview of where we're going. And these four topics are broadly what it looks like to progress through uh, adoption of Crossplane's features. And we're going to finish up there at the end with some of those future looking concepts, uh, like I mentioned. So since we have a lot of content, let's go ahead and get started. And we're going to start at the beginning with how folks usually hear about Crossplane uh, and get started with it. Uh, and that's uh, deploying your infrastructure and applications from a single API. So. The Crossplane community is full of uh, fairly pragmatic engineers, I'd say, although uh, if you ask our, our product managers, they may disagree from time to time. Uh, but a theme you're going to see throughout my presentation today and throughout the architecture of Crossplane and its related projects uh, is taking advantage of opportunities to leverage what's already there. Uh, and in some respects, we don't have much of a choice. Uh, with a project of such large scope as Crossplane, trying to build everything from scratch uh, would be kind of unproductive and not in service of our users, right? We already have some really great tooling that we can take advantage of. Uh, the most glaring example of Crossplane taking advantage of technology with an existing solid foundation is the fact that it's built on the Kubernetes API, right? So Kubernetes has become the de facto standard for deploying and managing applications, and it's rapidly grown beyond and becoming kind of a general API for distributed systems. And while we're big fans of Kubernetes and the Crossplane project, uh, and, and I'm personally a big fan. I was excited to hear uh, the shout out for the release team because that's been really impactful uh, in my career thus far. Definitely a big Kubernetes uh, fan. Uh, the abstractions that Kubernetes choose, though, are not necessarily what really sets it apart. Um, folks who have been around in the industry for some time may be familiar with some early competitors to Kubernetes like Mesos and Docker Swarm and, and, and countless others. Um, and some may have actually preferred the APIs and abstractions of those systems. It's actually not super uncommon that I hear people say that. Um, but ultimately, what calls Kubernetes to win, or at least win in my opinion, is what sets it apart today uh, is, and it's, it's availability, right? So no matter what cloud you use, no matter what on-prem virtualization software you employ, almost every environment today has the Kubernetes API in it. And what that means is that we have a common target that we can leverage when deploying software uh, and with Crossplane, uh, our infrastructure as well. So how do we uh, declaratively, declaratively describe application deployments in Kubernetes? Well, at the base level, we leverage those primitive Kubernetes APIs, right? Pods, deployments, et cetera, all these things that you're familiar with. These give us a common vernacular and serve as building blocks for higher level abstractions that can be defined via uh, components such as custom resource definitions and managed by controllers that we install into the cluster. And not only that, we, we can also use these primitives and abstractions built on top of them directly. There have also been an evolution of a robust ecosystem of tooling around templating and bundling groups of resources for distribution and deployment. So tools like Helm and Customize have almost become necessities when dealing with Kubernetes at, at any sufficient scale. So at the base level, Crossplane just introduces additional primitives to the Kubernetes API. And because these primitives follow the same conventions as those built into Kubernetes and composed on top of it, Crossplane's primitives can easily be added to existing application bundles without modifying the configuration that is already used. So let's take a really simple example, a, a to-do app that uses a MySQL database to persist state. A minimal Helm chart may include a deployment to actually run the application workload and a service to make it accessible. In order to connect to the database, it expects a secret that will exist with proper credentials that can be referenced by the deployment 
and injected into the application workload. If you've gone through a tutorial, right, this is the, the typical thing you're going to see. So what options do you have as a consumer for deploying the infrastructure required by this application? Well, while certainly unadvisable, an immediate solution would be to log into your cloud provider console, spin up a database, create a user on the database, obtain credentials, manually create a secret, and put the credentials in its contents. The primary issues with this approach include a lack of paper trail as to the actions that took place to provision the infrastructure, inability to easily replicate the provisioning process, inability to detect drift from desired state, and general overhead of manually clicking, clicking through an a UI. Many of these problems can be solved with solid infrastructure as code tools, such as Terraform and Pulumi. These give you the ability to store your infrastructure configuration and version control, run processes to evaluate drift, and establish automated pipelines to e execute the changes and updates. However, there are still major drawbacks to this approach. One being that this workflow is divorced from your application deployment, meaning that you are now trying to tie together infrastructure that was provisioned through one process and an application that was deployed through another. An additional drawback is that these tools are not designed to continuously reconcile your infrastructure, which is something we have come to take for granted with deploying our applications on Kubernetes. The final issue with this approach is permissioning, which we will dive deeper into when we talk about building our control plane on top of Crossplane. If we want to bring our infrastructure and application pipelines closer together, there's always the option of deploying your infrastructure as an application. However, the promise of cloud is removing the complexity of running your complex data services on your own. So going down this route is usually more pain for an organization. So what do we want? First of all, we want a consistent workflow for how we deploy both our applications and the infrastructure it depends on. This means that if you're using Argo CD, uh, notwithstanding the vulnerability we just uh, discussed, uh, to automatically deploy application changes with when a PR is merged to main in your Git repository, you should have the same process for updating your infrastructure. We also want the process of making infrastructure available for consumption to be integrated with provisioning and updating it. When manually provisioning infrastructure or using infrastructure as code tool, like we mentioned, you must find a way to get the necessary credentials to the applications that consume it. This can be incorporated into your separate infrastructure provisioning pipeline, but importantly, the relationship between the application and the credentials and the infrastructure is not represented in a single API. This can be thought of as a form of relationship modeling. A common representation means that you can relate objects to one another. Kubernetes has some of this built in in the form of owner and controller references, and Crossplane leverages those features to represent hierarchical relationships. And such a unit of infrastructure and its connection details, which can allow us to take advantage of garbage collection. Crucially, though, infrastructure does not live in a vacuum. With even minimal complexity, you'll find yourself in a web of networks, subnets, firewall rules, and more. And Crossplane gives you the ability to dynamically reflect the relationship between these resources in a consistent manner. Furthermore, it gives you the ability to model relationships with other Kubernetes native projects, such as Open Policy Agent, which gives you a robust policy framework for your infrastructure, basically for free. Lastly, we want the same resilience that Kubernetes gives our applications applied to our infrastructure. Crossplane is always watching your infrastructure, meaning that it can react to any form of drift whether it's due to a service outage or someone going rogue in the cloud provider console. So we're checking a lot of boxes here, right? Uh, do we need anything else or are we done? Well, I, I did say there's a lot of content, so you might have guessed that we're not quite done yet. But the next step uh, is building a control plane, because unfortunately, the world is not as simple as we're talking about here. If you're interested in Crossplane, I would hazard a guess that you are interested in some form of managed services, right? Otherwise, you would just go back to running that MySQL instance uh, as a deployment in your cluster. So what is it that we like about managed services? So I'm going to take a second here and step back and talk about trade-offs. Everything in life comes with trade-offs. You can attend an event or stay home and watch a movie. You can take a job offer or stay where you're currently at. If you're going to take a job offer, please take it at, at Upbound, upbound.io. The key is to find the trade-offs that make sense for the situation that you're in. Issues arise when someone starts to make decisions about the trade-offs for everyone. Why is that an issue? Because we're all different. Over the past 10 to 20 years, we've seen the rapid growth of cloud computing, which has greatly simplified the process of deploying and consuming infrastructure. However, when you simplify something, you inherently reduce some aspect of its functionality. 
What the cloud providers have promised us is a drastic reduction in complexity. This means that when I was in high school, I had the ability to provision a VM on the other side of the country while understanding a mere fraction of what was actually required to make that a reality. As the infrastructure as a service offerings have grown, more and more complexity has been shedded. This has come in the form of large cloud providers offering a wide variety of services, each varying in scope of use cases it can address. It has also come in the form of layer two cloud providers, taking the lower level services from tier one cloud providers and stripping away complexity in their own way. You may be familiar with services like Heroku or Render or others like that that kind of give you a, a nice clean interface uh, for interacting with uh, kind of simplified infrastructure. Though the sheer volume of services does create a compelling matrix of scope and complexity trade-offs, a key problem remains. Someone else is choosing those trade-offs for you. Initially, this might not be a problem. You may be happy to adopt the latest and greatest service from your favorite cloud provider, but at any sufficiently large scale, you're going to experience change. You may have a new customer that requires workloads to run in a region that is not supported by your cloud provider of choice. You may have a functionally strategic move from one financially strategic move, excuse me, from one cloud provider to another. A service you are using may make a change that is incompatible with your architecture. You may require a feature in a service that you are using that the cloud provider is unwilling to introduce. Those who have been in positions like these know how difficult a pivot can be. So I just talked about how Crossplane extends the Kubernetes API by bringing all these managed services as additional primi primitives, but that doesn't address our scope complexity trade-off. Our generic term for the custom resource definitions that Crossplane providers add to your clusters, like that RDS, RDS instance that we saw, is managed resources. So managed resources map one-to-one -one with the external API they're targeting. For instance, if you create an RDS instance by making a post request using curl to the AWS API, every option that is available in that API is also available in the RDS instance CRD that Crossplane's provider AWS introduces to your cluster. This means that Crossplane providers are giving you access to cloud provider services from the Kubernetes API, but you're still subject to those trade-off decisions that the cloud provider makes. So what does Crossplane do about it? Well, I'd love to sit here and say that we found the right abstraction for every type of infrastructure and that you need or will need in the future is all satisfied, but we learned pretty early on that there is no silver bullet. So instead of following the path of layer one and two cloud providers, we took a different approach. We don't want to simplify provisioning and managing your infrastructure. In fact, in my mind, that would be pretty arrogant assertion for us to try. We cannot hope to understand the architectures and complexities of every organization. So instead of simplifying your infrastructure, we give you the tools to do it. The primary tool in Crossplane to, to define your own infrastructure abstractions is referred to as composition, which is a generic term for talking about the set of technologies that allow this. I'm gonna walk through exactly how, how composition works under the hood. To utilize it starting out, you probably don't need to know all of this, but as I was mentioning to some of the panelists uh, before we started up, I'm definitely someone who likes to get behind the abstraction layer and understand what's going on. So even if not all of this sticks from tonight, it should give you a good idea when you're utilizing this technology, what's happening behind the scenes, and maybe help you trouble troubleshoot if you run into problems. So the first thing that we're going to do when utilizing composition is define an API for a high-level abstraction using a composite resource definition, or as what we refer to as an XRD. So this is different from a custom resource def definition or a CRD, uh, but it's going to look a lot similar. So in this example that we see here, we have a Kubernetes cluster, and we have uh, namespace-scoped API types, cluster-scoped API types, namespace-scoped resources, and cluster-scoped resources. So importantly, starting out, right, we have some, some uh, API types that aren't reflected here, pods, deployment, services, endpoints, et cetera, um, all those that you're familiar with. Uh, we also have things like RDS instance, VPC, subnets, et cetera, uh, that are introduced by installing cross-plane providers into your cluster, which means you can then create a, a resource of that type uh, and provision that externally. When you create an XRD, an instance of an XRD uh, in your cluster, uh, it defines two different CRDs that get rendered from Crossplane, one at the namespace scope and one at the cluster scope. So when these CRDs are created, it's essentially adding two new API types to your cluster. So when it creates these CRDs, you're now able to create these in, in your namespace if you're given proper RBAC or at the cluster scope. 
The nice thing about this separation of namespace and cluster scope means that you can have a strong separation between infrastructure admins and developers. Infrastructure admins may provision infrastructure that's relevant across development teams, um, such as you know a shared VPC or any other shared services. Meanwhile, developers are going to provision things that are more dedicated to the applications and workloads uh, that are consuming them. So once you have your XRD in place where you've essentially defined a, a new custom resource type, you define one or more compositions of managed resources, those granular types that are introduced by providers that satisfy that higher level XRD. So in this case, I'm defining two compositions, one that's cluster DB AWS and one that's cluster DB GCP. Behind the scenes, what that looks like is you know, perhaps an RDS instance or maybe a composition of a number of AWS resources like an RDS instance, a VPC and a subnet. And the, the schema that we provide on the XRD, which is our, our DB type here, uh, is gonna have a simplified field view that could be generic across different uh, compositions that satisfy it. We also have a GCP composition here, which could be comprised of something like a Cloud SQL instance and a network or a firewall rule or something like that. So both of these compositions exist. And when a developer actually comes along and creates an instance of that higher level resource, so in this case, my DB, which is of kind DB, it is gonna get matched to one of those compositions that satisfies it based on different qualities that you define on the abstract type. So in this case, we're demonstrating that the developer first creates an instance of a DB called my DB. It gets matched by crossplane to kind cluster DB and match to AWS in this case, which once again can be used with label selectors and such to select the composition of choice. And then it's gonna take whatever's defined in that composition for AWS. It's gonna do some lightweight templating that takes the fields that the developer put on the abstract resource type, and it's gonna map them to the granular resource types on the RDS instance, render that out, and then the provider AWS controller is gonna reconcile that by provisioning it externally and keeping it up to date. So you can already see here that we're able to define abstractions within our cluster. And because they're all Kubernetes objects, right? We can persist this relationship between them. So you can say, just because I'm presenting you an abstract type, that doesn't mean I don't have insight into how that renders out. And you could optionally give developers the ability to do that as well. So the first, the first question I get when I get to this point is, doesn't Terraform do that? And, and specifically what folks are talking about is modules, right? So with Terraform, there's there's concepts of higher level uh, types that can be composed of more lower level primitives. So in a way, yes, Terraform does this, but in general, composition is not a new concept. A great example of widely used composition is object-oriented programming, where we take primitive types of a programming language and compose them into higher level concepts. Similarly, the polymorphism that Crossplane supports by allowing multiple compositions to satisfy a single XRD type is not new. Looking at programming languages again, interfaces and generics are prime examples of describing something by the behavior it exhibits rather than its concrete attributes. Crossplane stands apart for the reasons that we enumerated earlier, including continuous reconciliation and native integration with the Kubernetes API, but there's a more subtle detail that can be lost when encountering this architecture for the first time. We like to call it bringing the level of permissioning to the level of abstraction. So let's look back at our final slide from des describing how composition works. You'll notice that the resource the developer creates in their namespace, MyDB in this example, is persisted. And the, re the relationship between it, the composition it matches to, and the resource, there being just one in this case, is represented. Because we are standardizing on Kubernetes RBAC, the developer is only given permission to create the abstract DB type. In fact, they don't even need to know that it's an RDS instance on AWS that is satisfying their request and providing connection information. This means that there is no concept of giving the developer permissions to any cloud provider or external service. You as the platform builder define the mappings from the abstract type that is presented to developers to the underlying managed resources that satisfy their request. Permissions are given to the provider controllers that reconcile the managed resources. And as part of the policy and mapping applied when rendering them, you can dictate what permissions are used based on all factors available to you. The namespace the request originated from, whether it's supporting a dev staging or prod environment, or any other attributes that may need to be factored in. This is in contrast to an infrastructure as code tool, which would render out the granular resources offline 
then need to access credentials to provision them as part of the same flow, meaning the developer either needs to be able to access those credentials on their local machine or access a remote system that can provide appropriately scoped credentials. Either way, you are moving farther away from doing everything from a consistent API and potentially landing, leading to access and permission sprawl. So where does that leave us? We now have a consistent API to deploy applications, right, as Kubernetes offers us, provision infrastructure, which we are able to do by just using managed resources directly. And with composition, we've shown we're able to provision infrastructure from the API using higher level abstractions, describing the functionality we need rather than a specific implementation. And we're able to build a control plane. So just like custom resource definitions allow us to extend the Kubernetes API by using the Kubernetes API itself, composite resource definitions or XRDs and compositions allow us to extend our custom control plane API using the same mechanisms. So checking in on our progress, we are now able to build and consume a declarative control plane on top of Kubernetes. So what comes next? I gave a talk last week on the data, at the Data on Kubernetes meetup where I talked about the evolution of software distribution. We started out with the first general purpose computer and worked our way up through the introduction of the stored program computer, the advent of the internet, the commercialization of virtual machines, and landed at containerization. Over the 60 or so years we covered, we kept moving closer to this concept of write once, run anywhere. In the modern era, write once, run anywhere has been accelerated first by the aforementioned popularization of containerization, which says, if you have a container runtime, you can run this software anywhere. Then the birth of Kubernetes said, if you have a cluster, you can deploy this distributed application anywhere. But there's a catch. Both of these technologies are self-contained. What I mean by that is that the promise they make of write once, run anywhere assumes that everything lives inside of their system. As soon as a dependency on something outside, let's say a managed service from a cloud provider is introduced, run anywhere is no longer a guarantee. However, a control plane can give you an interface to those external dependencies. It allows you to describe the behavior you need for an external dependency without being specific about the implementation. But we need a way to package and distribute these interfaces and implementations in a way that allows for a control plane to grow and evolve over time. Crossplane's answer to this is packages, which we view as the next evolution of software distribution, adding the required control plane components to the foundation established by containerization and Kubernetes. Let's take a look at how this works in practice. Before you roll your eyes and start into a rant about the fragmented landscape of package management, allow me to at least attempt to assuage some of your concerns by examining what makes up a crossplane package. Crossplane packages are just simplified OCI images which means there are countless publicly available services to host and distribute them. And most organizations already have an internal re registry that they use for private images. And because crossplane packages contain only a stream of YAML, concerns around storage and bandwidth requirements are minimal. They are so minimal, in fact, that a few weeks ago, we were able to put together a small WebAssembly application that will build and push a crossplane package to a container image registry, all from the browser. So what's actually inside these cross-plane packages? First, we should distinguish between our two types of packages, providers and configurations. Providers are the components that add managed resources and controllers to reconcile them to your cluster. Some common examples of these are provider AWS, provider GCP, but also some you might not think of, such as provider Helm. A provider can be written to target any API. Configurations are the distribution mechanism for our XRDs and compositions. A configuration package contains zero or more XRDs or compositions, which makes them quite a flexible tool for bringing together a control plane, as we'll see in a moment. However, perhaps the most important attribute of configuration packages is that they can depend on other provider and configuration packages. What this means is that installing just the My Control Plane package in this diagram can build this entire control plane as Crossplane will walk through the dependency tree installing all direct and transitive dependencies. If a dependency already exists in the cluster, Crossplane will check its version and make sure it's compatible with all dependent packages. Building a directed acyclic graph of dependencies is useful within an organization that wants to be able to reproduce its control plane in multiple clusters, allowing developers to have consistent abstractions across multiple environments and business units. However, 
it is arguable is arguably more useful when you want to expand your control plane to include new, new components. In this example, Cool Vendor has packaged their database product as a configuration package. It depends on provider GCP and provider SQL. In this Cool Vendor database configuration package, the vendor has supplied an XRD, giving the customer an abstract interface to provisioning the database on GCP. Cool Vendor has also included a composition in this package that brings together GCP VMs, networks, subnets, firewalls, rules, and plus SQL databases, tables, and users, and declared dependencies on provider SQL and provider GCP, guaranteeing that those managed resource types it's composing are going to be present in the cluster. The organization can simply update their My Databases configuration package to have a dependency on Cool Vendor database, which will cause Crossplane to install it along with the missing provider SQL and will verify that the existing provider GCP version is compatible. Just like that, developers in the organization are able to provision an abstract database through the same interface they were using, but they're able to have it satisfied by Cool Vendor database that is running on GCP. If you have more questions about how this works, I'm definitely happy to jump into this. This isn't the demo that we have uh, planned today, uh, but it is the one I gave last week. Um, so we can run through that if, if folks have enough interest for sure. Hey, Dan, mm -hmm. real quick, we do have a question from the, a uh, couple questions from the chat. Awesome. Uh, one from Brunton is, what is the typical pattern for deploying cross-plane to manage cloud infrastructure? Is it one-to-one -one cross plane to KH clusters for managing infrastructure in the environment? Uh, so it de really depends on the organization. Like I said, we see a lot of folks that start off uh, with using Crossplane um, directly targeting managed resources, right? And, and provisioning those directly. Um, in terms of the actual architecture of, of using Crossplane across multiple Kubernetes clusters, uh, typically folks either will put Crossplane in each of their application clusters. So let's say, you know, each, each, business unit within your organization has a separate Kubernetes cluster, you could put cross-plane in each of them. And because of this kind of reproducible control plane that I'm talking about, you can easily provide similar interfaces in all of them and maybe adjust permissions to namespaces and things like that. Um, kind of more mature users will see actually have kind of a, a Uber control plane, if you will, where they have a, a single cluster uh, that has cross-plane installed into it which will then provision other Kubernetes clusters. And because we have things like Provider Helm that I mentioned uh, a few slides ago, uh, you're able to actually put the things in that cluster to you know, give it the same functionality, sometimes even installing Crossplane itself uh, using Crossplane. How does, how, does that Uber, how does that Uber control plane scale? So, it, know, it, so it it, for example, I have 380 clusters across 115 cloud projects on multiple providers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so so it's really uh, a fairly lightweight, right? Because these are just objects that are being reconciled in, in a Kubernetes cluster. So it, it certainly depends on, you know, how you've architected the cluster that's running Crossplane itself. Um, if you're using more layers of abstraction, right, you're going to have more overhead with more controllers running and that sort of thing. That being said, uh, if you need to fragment that out into multiple clusters, there's really no issue uh, with, you know, let's say you're concerned about having uh, a bunch of... Uh, Kubernetes cluster, EKS cluster, CRDs, let's say, um, or instances of those CRDs managed by, you know, a single instance, you could have them managed by multiple if you like. But doesn't that mean your control plane then starts to sprawl and you have more overhead of managing X number of things across all those clusters in that way? So it, it depends, right? If you want to bring them all to a single cluster, you can unify them. It, you know, at, at a certain stage, right, you'd have to scale that Kubernetes cluster to accommodate it. But one way that we see folks kind of combat that sprawl if you do have to have multiple clusters uh, is we recommend everything go through version control, right? So you have a single source of truth. And, um, you know, I won't get too deep into the offerings of Upbound, but, uh, you know, there is tooling that exists to be able to have kind of a single pane of glass across multiple control planes um, and seeing how your infrastructure is all related together. Uh, Dan, one other question from the chat is um, around the AWS controllers for Kubernetes or ACK. Uh, the question is like, how does the cross plane project feel about that sort of thing? Mm 
um, would you use them as like backing for the higher order components or is it just not solving the same problem? Um, yeah, that, that's a great question. Um, so right now we have a, a pretty tight actually integration uh, with the ACK project. Our provider, uh, AWS, uh, actually generates its resources from the same pipeline that ACK does, and we both contribute to that. Um, ACK is obviously not focused on kind of like this composition of higher level abstractions, and it's certainly not focused um, in going across multiple cloud providers or, or multiple environments. Um, so they do differ in that way. There's also some deeper technical differences around just uh, how controllers are deployed and that sort of thing. For instance, ACK deploys separate controllers for each type of resource. Uh, or, or separate, I shouldn't say separate controllers, separate controller managers, you might say, for each uh, type of resource, uh, whereas Crossplane bundles those together into a single deployment, um, and and can you can do some fragmenting of that. But um, yeah, it, it's typically kind of a more of a provisioning tool rather than a building a control plane tool. All right. Well, it looks like I'm looking in the chat too. It looks like that's what we've got for now, but definitely feel free to interrupt me uh, if more do come up here. Um, all right. So as I said before, uh, Crossplane doesn't simplify your infrastructure, right? It wants to give you the tools to do so. But in the example we were just looking at, which I'll, I'll flip back to for a second here. In that example, the vendor was assuming the customer used GCP, but it certainly doesn't have to. Since constructing these packages only requires writing a little bit of YAML, Cool Vendor could work with a customer to customize a solution to use abstractions that already exist in their control plane, perhaps using a tailor-made on-prem solution for VMs and networks instead of the primitives that GCP offers. So here, you know, we're imagining that this, this customer has a provider on-prem on and they've made a My VMs abstraction in front of that, right? They've created a, a type in their cluster as a virtual machine. If Cool Vendor database was just targeting primitives on GCP and you know they had on-prem solutions that could match that, they could easily just target those instead um, because a Cool Vendor could just bring in XRD. So there's no silver bullet, and a vendor can build something, can't build something that will fit into every environment. Uh, but we can reduce the pain, right, of shifting uh, the implementation behind the interface that the vendor provides, which is beneficial, right, to both the vendor uh, and and the customer. And to finish off this point, the customer could do this on their own uh, or without actually requiring any modification from the vendor package at all. Um, so if Cool Vendor Database defines an XRD that offers an interface for consumption, there's nothing stopping, stopping the customer from writing a configuration package that includes a new composition that satisfies that interface, right? So we don't have to define our XRDs and, and, and compositions together. A, a vendor could ship a XRD uh, and you could provide a composition to satisfy that. This means that uh, small adapters can be developed to take heterogeneous infrastructure and make it all play together nicely. And the great thing about packages being OCI images is that they are easy to distribute, which means that we can build libraries of infrastructure abstractions uh, that can be shared out into the community and consumed. So uh, in the Crossplane community, we envision a future where Crossplane packages revolutionize the process of building a control plane in the same way that open source libraries have revolutionized the way we build software. Instead of starting out by creating managed resources using provider AWS directly, you could use the AWS best practices configuration package, which would provide common abstractions that allow you to safely and efficiently provision infrastructure. As you grew as an organization, you could then build your own packages that compose those abstractions uh, or manage resources directly. Uh, and like I said, if you want to see a demo of this scenario in action, I gave one last week, uh, and I'm also happy to, to chat with folks after this. All right, so we've covered a lot of topics, and uh, since this is on Zoom, I can't tell if the whole audience has already bailed on the talk, but I'm guessing at least some of y'all stuck around for Duffy's awesome talk that's going to come up after this. Uh, but we're in the home stretch here, and I just want to talk a little bit about the final phase of this presentation, uh, which is its namesake, Day 2 Operations on Crossplane. So we've seen that Crossplane offers powerful tools for taking granular managed resources and composing them into higher level abstractions that fit the requirements of your specific organization. Up until this point, this has been sufficient for many Crossplane users. 
folks have been able to build robust, fully featured control planes with many developer teams utilizing these abstractions. However, for Crossplane to truly be a universal control plane, it needs to support the ability to provide what I like to call the glue bits. Every architecture has at least a little bit of custom logic that doesn't fit into your normal declarative infrastructure. While writing a custom provider is certainly possible, and many folks do it, we need to have an accessible higher level abstraction that doesn't require intimate knowledge of Kubernetes control theory or how to effectively write a reconciliation loop. If we take a simplified view of communication in a Kubernetes cluster where Crossplane is installed, it looks something like this. Crossplane is mapping it abstractions to concrete implementations, then rendering managed resources that provider controllers then reconcile by making HTTP requests to the cloud provider API. This covers a lot of use cases, but only gives you what the cloud provider API offers. So once again, we're being reduced to the simplifications they've made. So what happens if you need to run custom logic to back up your database? What happens if you want to send a message to a Slack channel when a resource is provisioned or reaches an unhealthy state? Though we typically think of controllers as monoliths that run in your cluster, there is no reason why all our logic has to be aggregated to a single location. In the Crossplane community, we've been experimenting with the idea of control plane functions. Functions are the bits that fill in the parts of a control plane that don't make sense in your typical declarative API. However, because we have defined all of our infrastructure in a single API, we have a unique opportunity to invoke these functions based off the state of one or more components of our control plane that typically would be complex to relate, right? So bringing, bringing all of our infrastructure to a common representation means that we're now able to trigger different events uh, based on relationships between them. The idea of fragmenting Kubernetes controllers is not new, but introducing them in this context provides some powerful opportunities. As an example, the control plane could run in a hosted setting, but sensitive operations that require access to, to credentials can run in a trusted environment. So you could think of that as kind of like a last mile scenario where we're doing the heavy computation in a hosted cluster, then reaching out to a Lambda function or an on-prem environment, which may run in a VPC with the infrastructure it's modifying uh, to do that last mile interaction. Uh, and I started off by saying, we're gonna talk about some things that aren't currently implemented. Um, and this is one of them. So these ideas are still in their early stages, but the possibilities are definitely uh, really exciting. Uh, so I prepare, prepared a, a proof of concept demo that we can go through today. And it's not super eventful, but it gives you a little bit of a feel for what this experience would look like. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and jump into that. And it looks like we might have a few more questions here. Um, so feel free to go ahead and ask those uh, while I'm switching over here. Yeah, I think uh, continuing along on some of the previous discussion on scaling out and sort of the relationship between the cross plane control plane to the resources, scale of the resources that it's reconciling. Um, is there anything, and I'm gonna take a little uh, artistic interpretation here of the question because um, I think I've seen a question like this before, but is there any special um, consideration within the um, reconciliation loops of the cross plane um, control plane that uh, allow for sort of distributing the load of, of reconciliation across like multiple replicas or anything like that? Um, if you get to the point to where like the number of resources that it's trying to reconcile um, kind of tips over at a certain point. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I don't have specific numbers on the number of objects it's going to tip over. Um, that is very subject, right, to your configuration of those. Because if you know it's failing to update against an API, then it's going to uh, enqueue a lot of uh, reconciliations. Um, however, I will talk a little bit about you know how we combat that. So we use typical controller runtime rate limiting uh, to be able to configure both at a controller level, um, how backup happens when you're in, in encountering errors, as well as at a global level. Um, we also allow you to configure the poll interval. So right, you're, you're checking drift detection um, all the time uh, with, with these controllers. And some resources, it doesn't make sense to check every minute, let's say. Some you might need every day, some you might need every hour. Um, so we allow you to configure the poll interval. Um, in terms of actually uh, kind of partitioning across multiple replicas, um, as, as we'll, well, I guess, yeah, well, we could see here in this example um, that I'm about to show, uh, we have what's called a provider config, and you can have multiple provider configs. 
um, for a for any provider that you install. This basically is a pointer to some credentials that are either in a Kubernetes secret and your file system in an environment variable, et cetera. So there's a proposal right now uh, to actually partition providers um, on the provider config. So what that would look like is everything goes through the cross-plane package manager. So when you install a provider, you actually create a, a YAML manifest, right? That says, um, please make this provider exist in my cluster. Um, and the package manager will, you know, start the deployment, install the CRDs, et cetera. So uh, if we have defined provider config CRDs in, in each of these packages, uh, you could actually dynamically start up controllers, which is actually similar to how composition works, um, but dynamically start up controllers for each provider config, which means that you could, you know, define different partitions with different levels of reliability. So um, let's say you wanted uh, all of your dev infrastructure to be reconciled once a day, right? But you wanted your production infrastructure reconciled much more frequently. Um, there's lots of different configurations that organizations want. So once again, we're trying not to say like, this is how the one way to do it. We're trying to give you as many knobs to turn as possible. Another big aspect of this, which I don't think was covered in the question, but I'm guessing uh, is, is uh, top of mind for this individual perhaps uh, is you know, uh, provider rate limiting. So externally, uh, most, most APIs aren't going to allow you to hit it an unlimited number of times. Um, and while you may have a, a, you know, robust agreement with your cloud provider, uh, you're likely going to run up with that with the sufficient number of objects, uh, and how it actually per partitions, uh, rate limiting on its side is highly variable as well. So for instance, AWS does it by account and region, I think, or something like that. Um, whereas, you know, other, uh, other APIs will do it by user, which means you could, you know, just create more users and, and uh, kind of get around it that way. So there's lots of different ways, but basically we expose those configuration parameters to you to be able to tune it to your needs. All right, so I have just brought up a, a local kind cluster here, and I'm going to go ahead and uh, install UXP, which is actually just the, the upbound distribution of Crossplane, but um, it, it, is conformant with crossplane and, and will look exactly the same. Um, so we can actually see that we should have some pods present here. Let me try to make that a little more digestible. Um, so the primary ones here are crossplane and the crossplane RBAC manager. Um, and this directory I'm in here is a project called Crisscross, um, which is kind of the mechanism we are looking at in that slide. Uh, and what it is, is it's actually a provider itself that allows you to register endpoints with it that say, uh, when events happen on this object, uh, go ahead and hit this endpoint. It's kind of arbitrary um, as to you know how it does that. So once again, this is a proof of concept of what this might look like um, in the future. So definitely welcome feedback. There's been some great uh, questions uh, already, so please keep those coming. Um, all right, uh, so I'm going to start off by installing um, provider AWS. Uh, well, actually, I'll start off by creating uh, my credential secret. So like I said, uh, when you use a provider, uh, you're actually going to you know, have to provide it credentials to provision things. Um, and so uh, we're going to use a Kubernetes secret in this case to provide our credentials. So I'll go ahead and create that in the cluster. Um, so now that's present. And I'm going to go ahead and install uh, the AWS provider. So I'm saying I want uh, cross-plane provider AWS. And I'm also going to install the crisscross provider, uh, which is the one we're going to be using here today. So I will go ahead and do that. All right, so now that those are present, we can take a look at the packages that are present in our cluster. And you'll see we have crisscross and provider AWS. The way packages work under the hood is that the, it's similar to like a replica set or, or something like that, um, where you have different revisions. Um, and so if we take a look at our provider revisions, you can see that uh, we have one for the specific version of that provider we installed, which means that you can then you know update to a new version and roll back and that sort of thing. All right, um, so with those installed, I'm going to go on and um, use my uh, AWS example here. So when we install those providers, uh, we brought along all of the CRDs that are relevant for them. So if we look at the CRDs that are present in our cluster, you're going to see AWS resources that you know represent all of those external API types. 
Um, and so I'm going to go ahead and apply our examples. Uh, and the examples here are going to create a provider config, which is going to point at those secrets that we created and a bucket that's going to use those credentials. So we can take a look at our bucket and buckets come up really quickly because they're easy to provision. And this has actually already been created on AWS and we can look at what the manifest looks like here. Um, we can see that it has been successfully synced and it is ready for consumption. Uh, this is a really simple bucket in US East one. Uh, and the name is, let's see if we can find the annotation. Uh, Kate's ATL crossplane day two. So we now have a bucket on AWS. And what I want to do now is register a function uh, to be able to trigger whenever uh, something happens on this resource. So I, before we got started here, I went ahead and uh, created this uh, NOP uh, function on Cloud Run, which basically just logs whenever it gets hit uh, by, uh, by a reconciliation. Uh, so we can see here that we haven't had any updates here because it hasn't been uh, targeted by a cluster. Um, but crisscross allows us to point directly at this with this registration type. So I'm basically saying uh, for this type that I've defined, I want to be notified on any reconciliations of it. Um, and I've given it the URL to hit with that. So we can go ahead and deploy this in our cluster. All right, and when that's deployed, uh, we should pretty soon here uh, start seeing that uh, we're getting some traffic here. Uh, it may take a minute for it to load uh, in the UI, but uh, let's see if it will come up and give us something pretty fast. This is a bit laggy. But essentially what's happening when we're doing this is we're spinning up a new controller uh, that watches for bucket types. Uh, and instead of you know running a reconciliation loop, it just has a reconciliation loop that says, send all the information you have uh, to this endpoint. Um, this one is just gonna log it. Um, and so we should see it appear in the logs here. Let's see if it's come through yet. Yep, so you can see here that we've uh, started to receive observations and receive update. Um, and I put together a simple framework uh, that basically just logs these different reconciliation uh, types. So we can take a quick look at what that looks like, right? So we just have four endpoints here uh, that just get targeted and log a message and, and send back kind of an empty response. Um, and so you can start to imagine what you'd want to do in any of these cases, right? So um, in the case that a resource was deleted, um, you could say, you know, I want to notify someone in my Slack channel, or I want to clean up these dependent resources. Another thing we see a lot of times in crossplane uh, is, uh, you know, resources that may on the cloud provider side have side effects, um, and you may want to clean those up. So a good example is if you have a Kubernetes cluster, a GKE cluster specifically, um, I know that there's been folks that have had issues with, um, you know, like load balancers being left behind and stuff when you clean up that cluster. So you could have a nice function that says, uh, whenever a GKE cluster gets deleted, go ahead and make sure that there's no load balancers left behind. So once again, this is just giving you kind of a smaller unit uh, and also a more flexible one. You could write this in any language. You could deploy as a Lambda function. You could do it as Cloud Run, as we're seeing here, um, but allows you to kind of expand the functionality uh, of your control plane uh, to your custom needs. I know that I am probably running up on time a little bit here. Um, so I will stop and see if there's any additional questions. Um, and also, uh, if, if we need to move on, go ahead and let me know as well. Uh, I think we're good right now. Uh, we're actually pinging D Duffy uh, to see where he is. I think he might be handling something for a moment. So feel, oh, he's with us. Um, yeah, I think there's just discussion going on in the chat, but I don't think there's any pending questions. Cool. Um, well, one thing I will say is, is uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, I do like to kind of shove a lot of information into presentations, uh, which is debatably useful, uh, but I do like to engage with folks afterwards. Um, so there's some good questions. I know there was some around uh, scaling um, and that sort of thing. I just saw a, a good message here about uh, cleaning up EBS volumes for your EKS clusters. Um, 
so please do feel free to reach out. You can obviously join our Slack channel um, and I'm happy to chat with you um, or you can just ping me on email or Twitter or wherever else. Um, and definitely happy to walk through this further. Um, another thing I'd encourage you to do is some of these uh, kind of like preliminary things we're talking about are reflected in issues uh, on our, our cross-plane, cross-plane Git repo. Uh, so please feel free to weigh in there uh, as well. Awesome. Thanks so much, Dan. That was awesome. That's very cool. Uh, and we do uh, a social hour generally after. Uh, so if you have time, definitely stay around. I'm sure people have a lot of questions. Thanks oh, yeah. I'm not going to leave before, uh, before Duffy goes. I would be foolish <laughs> on my part. Yeah, don't want to miss that. Um, and with that, uh, I will go ahead and uh, move on to our next presenter, which is Mr. Uh, Duffy So Fancy Cooley, who's the field CTO at Isovalent. And he's going to be talking to us about uh, Cilium and eBPF today. Thank you very much. That was <clears throat> so, yeah, I'm Duffy. I'm a field CTO at Isovalent, and I'm here to talk to you about um, Cilium and eBPF and kind of give you some context. And that word's going to come up a lot in this presentation around um, what we do, what eBPF is, how it all works, and that sort of stuff. Uh, so let's get going here. <laughs> Mr. So Fancy goes there. All right. So I'm sure that you've heard a lot about eBPF. Um, <clears throat> and you've heard them described as superpowers for your system. And in the context of this talk, I hope to explain a little bit about why people are referring to them as superpowers, like why they're so interesting. Um, effectively, they uh, they represent sort of a highly efficient sandbox virtual machine inside of the Kubernetes inside of the Linux kernel that give you a way to attach um, business logic at pretty much any at any event that happens at that Linux kernel layer. Yeah, thank you, Dan. That was an amazing talk. So to visualize this, let's take a look at this at, at this um, at this slide. Right. This gives us the ability, <clears throat> since the since the Linux operating it, pretty much any OS kernel really is event driven. That means that everything that happens at a kernel layer is represented by an event. <clears throat> so we have events coming in from different physical and virtual devices like network cards or storage devices, and we also have processes that are making system calls like file open or exec a binary. Uh, all of these are individual system calls. And with eBPF, the extended Berkeley file, file system, with this particular um, uh, mechanism, we can attach at uh, at the point of effectively at the point of entry for any of those events and start capturing context or manipulating what happens when those events are called. So there's quite a lot of capability here, and it really gives us a lot of ability to. I mean, I think for the most part, a lot of people are using eBPF today to kind of understand context, to understand when an application is being started or when a file is opened or when a network call happens or when any of these things happen, I want to understand contextually what's happening. And this is really interesting because it represents sort of a graduation from the way that we used to do auditing and event control in the Linux kernel with things like audit D and mechanisms like that. We're kind of uh, with containerization and namespaces happening, we kind of needed to elevate the place where we were actually watching for those events right up to the kernel layer so that we could see what was happening and contextually understand what was happening inside of containers as containers really started taking off. So the way that we do that, <clears throat> so how do we so how do we get to the context? Like how do we actually do it? Um, there is there are we have things like helpers which are defined within the libbpf library and also in a variety of other libraries that you can find if you're going to if you decide to kind of explore this stuff and these helpers represent kind of they take sort of the stable kernel api that is exposed to ebpf and give you tools to easily uh, gather context around what's happening at a process or c group level they give you tools to manipulate network packets right so when somebody does when when a process uh, creates a connect to some external uh, entity, could be an IP address or a URL or what have you, we can actually kind of control what the destination IP or any of those things are by, by leveraging BPF. <clears throat> and we also have helpers that give us access to things like eBPF maps and for socket data. So like if you wanted to understand the latency between ICMP packets at you know the way that, the way that you might do it inside of a ping, um, we can also gather that latency data directly from the socket data uh, represented inside of the Linux kernel. 
let's talk a little bit more about eBPF maps and what they do for us. So eBPF maps, I mean, as I, you've heard me say this quite a lot, there's a lot of context that we can gather, but how do we make that context available to user space programs? Like how do we get the data out so that we can make it available to things like, I don't know, a metric scraper or you know, something that's going to effectively uh, export event data to maybe Elasticsearch or Splunk? How do we, how do we kind of glue these pieces together? And maps are the way that we do that. So map, <coughs> eBPF maps can hold programs, it can hold program state. And there's a variety of different map types, right? There's hash tables, arrays, uh, least recently used or LAU um, maps. There's ring buffers and stack traces and longest prefix matches. Um, Think about like the ream buffer front one, for example. So if what we're trying to do is basically watch for any bash program that, or any uh, you know, read line from a bash program that started up, I want to be able to see everything that anybody typed into uh, any shell on the system. And I want to be able to emit that as maybe a string that I will send to some, to some table in Elasticsearch. I might use a ring buffer to capture every one of those things and then have something on the in user space that is basically dumping that ring buffer to, file, to a file system in a file and then have something like <coughs> Fluent D or some such that actually kicks that, uh, the content of that file and, and syncs it up to Elasticsearch. And so this is how we can kind of glue together what's happening up at the top inside of the kernel layer, inside of kernel space, back down to user space and make, avail and make that state or what we've learned contextually available to outside things. Let's take an example of this one here. So this is a K-probe example. <clears throat> and this is an example of running a program against the XVE uh, or EX, the exec VE um, system call. Like, and this is kind of similar to what we were talking about before, right? So what this is going to watch for is it's going to actually watch for any system call that begin, you know, starts up a binary. So if you were to type bash at the command line or you know, curl or any of those things, we'd be able to, on, on the return of that binary, be able to um, gather some context about it. Right? And so in this case, we're watching for a PID. We're going to look for the return of that process, like whether it succeeded or not. We're going to get the current context of that, uh, of that event. And we're going to, and we're going to gather, we're going to capture that and send it to a, a map. So, and this is all pretty neat, but let's talk a little bit more about like how EPF loading works, right? So, we talked about eBPF being superpowers, and as you can imagine, with great power comes great responsibility. So, what so what have we done with the, within the Linux kernel to combat the problem of like, if anybody can develop a you know can can write sandbox code uh, in the Linux kernel, like if you could just compile an application and throw it in the Linux kernel and have that Linux kernel operate uh, on any packet or process or anything else inside of the kernel, what are we doing to kind of like make that safe, right? <clears throat> So the way that this happens is in a couple of different methods, right? So we have a verifier. Whenever you're going to compile a, uh, a um, you know, bytecode that you're going to inject into the Linux kernel, that verifier does some checking to make sure that the content of that program isn't going to run in a forever loop, is reasonably is reasonably within its bounds, and it's going to terminate at some point. Um, and if it finds like and if it finds that any of these things are not true, then it will complain and not allow for the compilation of the of the bytecode. And then we have the just-in-time compiler, the ability to actually um, make sure this bytecode this byte is compiled against the type of CPU that you have, against the instruction set specific to your architecture so that we can, we can make this somewhat portable. Between these two, they basically make sure that the bytecode that you're injecting into the Linux kernel is reasonably safe. So who are the contributors to UEPF? <coughs> Um, right now, it's actually kind of spread across a lot, of, a, a, a bunch of large companies and isovalent. <laughs> so, we've actually had a, a number of really great contributors from isovalent, like Daniel Borkman, who I work with, Andre from Facebook, a bunch of different folks from Facebook, and from uh, Google that are they're constantly developing against um, BPF. But it's really growing, and if you wanted to become a contributor to it, I'd recommend joining the um, Slack dot. The, the Slack at isovalent. If you go to ebpf.io, you'll find a link to the country, the contribute page. So if this is some, a place that you want to play with or learn more about, definitely jump into the community. Um, 
One of the other things I'll share here is that the EBPF Summit is coming up. I believe it's August 12th and 13th. I'll be co-hosting. And so if you haven't already registered, go to ebpf.io and you'll see a link at the top to the summit. It's a free registration. Go ahead and join us and learn even more about EBPF at that summit. Who are the users of EBPF? This is actually kind of a neat thing. There's obviously a bunch of really great folks. Every customer of Cilium or Isovalent is a user of EBPF. Um, but I have a really great quote here uh, that, was, uh, that came out uh, in the most recent EBPF summit. <coughs> Nikita Sharkov from the Facebook traffic team uh, works, on, works on basically landing all of the traffic for Facebook. <coughs> Excuse me. They've been say, they said that as of May 2017, Facebook has been running uh, eBPF in production for four years. So every packet that passes to Facebook from the internet in general is going through EBP, uh, eBPF and XDP uh, at Facebook. Pretty amazing stuff. And we're seeing a lot more um, really great use cases out there for doing stuff like this, including kind of uh, leveraging both the networking pieces, the uh, monitoring and observability pieces. There's a bunch of great, great new projects that are kind of coming out into that space as well. If you want to learn more, like I said, check out the summit. So that brings us to what is Cilium. So as I said, we can do a lot with the context that we learn about at the kernel layer. And we can manipulate packets, we can accelerate traffic, we can do all kinds of interesting things. And Cilium is positioned to be the platform on top of which we can develop uh, features that make use of all of this context. We're going to walk through kind of the major use cases of Cilium in this, in, in this deck. We're going to talk about networking, we're going to talk about security, and we're going to talk about observability in this next section. Excuse me. So Cilium at its base is a CNI, and this represents kind of the entry point for the Cilium product inside of your Kubernetes cluster. And on top of that CNI, we'll be able to build a lot more interesting things and make, it, and make them part of the offering. So a CNI is that thing that's used to allow pods to communicate, sometimes enable traffic into and out of your cluster. And they provide network device configuration for your pods, basically handing that pod an IP address and an interface and making sure that all the traffic that has to move back and forth between the pods and the, and the nodes themselves or between the nodes are, are, all, are all handled by that CNI. It can be built in a, a, a variety of ways, whether, to, whether we choose to route pod networks or whether we choose to define an overlay and make it so that those pod IPs can only communicate in the, in the scope of the cluster itself. There's a, there's a variety of different ways that this can be, that this can be handled um, by a CNI. Most naive implementations of a CNI leverage technique uh, mechanisms like IP tables to limit um, access between pods, um, or they limit access, uh, or they use IP tables to uh, implement services and stuff. Let's talk a little bit about services here as well, right? So, um, Cube Proxy, for example, has a couple of different mechanisms to implement uh, the service construct within Kubernetes. And the service construct is if you were to define, say, a deployment of Nginx, I know that a lot of you folks, this is going to be repetitive for a lot of folks, but just bear with me. Um, when you define a service that represents more of, a, more of a stable IP or a contextual thing that any other, any other application within your Kubernetes cluster can use to identify or interact with that service, that is generally implemented inside of your Kubernetes nodes inside of IP tables. And it's implemented in a very consistent way across all of the nodes, but in fact, it's just leveraging IP tables. So right now, when you think about the scalability of, of Kubernetes itself, this is one of the first pieces still to go. And it's, it's improved a lot over time, but as you grow the number of services and the number of pods, you run into problems with IP tables because it doesn't really, because any, there's no atomicity in IP tables. If you make any change to an IP tables rule, even though it might feel and look like you're actually making a single line change, that represents a complete reload of all of the IP tables rules every single time. The way that Cilium handles this is we run an agent on each node um, and we can handle the tunneling or direct routing like as we talked about before. But the difference is that we're using eBPF to handle the data plane. And that means that we take traffic directly from the pod. We write an eBPF program for handling traffic from that particular application or from that, net or that, from that network namespace. And we can define basically within that program, like what 
entities that application can talk to. So we're able to implement things like network policy directly within that program, that EBPF program sitting inside your kernel attached directly to that network namespace. And we can also do things like key proxy replacement. In fact, for the most part, we do replace a lot of the functionality of kubeproxy, even when you just install kubeproxy, even if you install Cilium and kubeproxy next to each other. And by that, I mean, if traffic is moving back and forth between pods on the same node, that traffic, in, and it's defined, uh, and you're using a service to define that traffic, we actually take the, we, we take the, um, we compile into that mechanism, that EVPF program that is attached to the network namespace for that particular pod, um, a way to understand the other pods that are adjacent, and we just route that traffic directly between processes. It never it never comes down to user space, right? Since we're implementing network policy up at that higher level, we can still be very secure about what traffic we allow or disallow, but we can actually shortcut that traffic from user space. So that traffic just moves right back and forth between the pods. If you remove Kube proxy entirely, we can do that shortcutting kind of in the entire cluster. If you have Kube proxy sitting, then we only just do uh, kind of a partial replacement there. So we're very adaptable and this all happens kind of under the covers. It's not even really a thing that you can figure with Cilium directly. So we talked a little bit about Kubernetes services. You know, they, they provide East West connectivity, the durable abstractions. We talked about the the the, the challenges that um, IP table that Cube Proxy uses, the, the challenges in the way that Cube Proxy implements IP tables. I think this is a repetitive slide. I probably should have hidden it, but um, again, it leverages IP tables to do it. It's a linear list. All rules have to be replaced every time you make a change. So if a pod goes away or a new pod shows up or if you're scaling services, all of this represents churn in IP tables on every single node. And that churn is represented and that churn is felt for all services and all pods on each node every time a change is made. EBPF uses a per CPU. Um, in Cilium, we use a per CPU hash table for this kind of configuration. So we can be a lot more atomic and a lot more dynamic about those changes. So as things, as churn within the cluster happens, we're able to handle, uh, we're able to be a lot more atomic and a lot more dynamic in the way that we understand this state. But let's take another example. Let's take load balancing, for example. So uh, in the load balancing, in a, in a load balancing mechanism, like a service type load balancer, for example, um, most uh, Kubernetes doesn't come with a default one. Uh, generally speaking, the way that load balancer load balances are implemented within Kubernetes is through likely an abstraction that you have with your cloud service provider. So if you've deployed Kubernetes using EKS or AKS or Google or any of those mechanisms, then what happens is when you create a service of type load balancer, there's controller code running inside of your cluster that calls out to that cloud provider and creates a load balancer for you. And the way that it does that is it will actually map the, um, the load balancer to the backends that have been defined by that service, uh, or it'll map that load balancer to all of the nodes within your Kubernetes cluster, and it will route that traffic from the load balancer back to all of the nodes. Now there are some tweaks that can be made here, right? Like by default, most of the implementations set something like external traffic policy so that traffic only successfully lands on those nodes where the service is present. Regardless of how much capacity of that service is available on that node, if the node has any of the services available, then it will start answering the phone for that load balancer. And I saw, I call this naive because it basically has to, uh, it, it means that you can very easily end up in an imbalanced situation wherein like say you have you know, better than 50% of your availability on node two and only some of your availability on node one, the load balancer doesn't know that and it will equally, it will split that traffic between the two. With EBPF, we have, with Cilium, we have the ability to define load balancing as part of the Cilium uh, CNI. So you can define particular load balancer nodes within your Kubernetes cluster, or you can define external load balancers and we can actually handle routing that traffic back to pods directly because we're using that look, that generic box, you know, a Linux box or a Kubernetes node um, to route that traffic pod to pod. This is not too dissimilar from the ingress controller if you, th if you think about it, but the difference is that we're able to leverage things like uh, XDP and EUPF to actually also handle the routing and security pieces of this. So one of the other big benefits of a mechanism like this inside of Cilium is that we're able to use XDP to do things like you know, handle things like DDoS mitigation, right? So if you actually were able to determine that you had a particular set of IP um, source addresses that were really beating up on your uh, on your service from the outside world, 
and you can actually implement a policy inside of inside of Cilium that will just drop that traffic at XDP, which means that as the packet comes in or as those attack packets come into the NIC, they're dropped right there in the NIC. XDP can actually be um, offloaded to your network interface card itself. And that means that the network interface card itself will drop that stuff and it will never actually use any CPU or any, um, any, any compute time inside of the node itself. So we can do a lot of really pretty neat things with X with Cilium, with uh, eBPF and XDP with Cilium. <clears throat> Cilium has a mix of users on a variety of different platforms, whether on-prem or in the cloud. And we've learned a lot about integrating Cilium as a CNI in a variety of environments. So we handle things like chaining, right? So if you have, if you're in EKS and you wanna to continue to use the, the, the EKS CNI, we can chain Cilium on top of that and provide things like network policy and a lot of the functionality that we've described here um, on top of or chained in front of behind the nice behind the uh, behind the ENI uh, CNI itself. GKE, which is a relatively popular Kubernetes implementation, uh, uses uh, uses Cilium by default now, which is it's chosen that as the data plane V two as the future of networking on in front in front of uh, all Kubernetes Kubernetes all Google Kubernetes engine. Uh, clusters today. We also have a feature called Cluster Mesh. As you kind of get into some of the more advanced capabilities, I'm going to get that question here in just one second. Um, as you get into some of the more advanced capabilities of Kubernetes, or as you think about starting to scale Kubernetes, you realize that we have to consider the, the fault domain of the Kubernetes cluster itself. And that means that you start thinking about, you know, how can I build more of a, a highly available or resilient architecture with multiple Kubernetes clusters so that I can have things that fall within a particular fault domain um, without, and, and I might be able to lose an entire Kubernetes cluster without actually, um, and, and that would just mean a reduction in the capacity of my service rather than a complete downtime of my, of, of my service entirely, right? So mechanisms like this actually make, make, it avail, make that possible. So what we can do with Cluster Mesh is we can basically make it so that it's a flat IP space between all of your Kubernetes clusters at the pod level, right? And we can do this with uh, operative encryption enabled so that all of these clusters are part of the same encryption, encrypted, uh, fully, fully encrypted mesh so that pod traffic back and forth between all of the nodes on all of the clusters is encrypted on the wire. Um, but we can also do things like a model like this, where we have a shared service in some centralized cluster. We've built a cluster mesh between all three of these clusters. We're hosting the vault service inside of that shared cluster where we have a lot more control. Um, and, we're, and we're able to audit like what's happening with vault, who generated tokens, who's accessing it from the secret perspective, all of that stuff. All of our auditing capabilities really focused on that shared service cluster. But applications deployed in other clusters can consume vault as a service directly over that encrypted link between the clusters. So it gives us the ability to find a global service. We're working on doing things like um, percentage routing for services across, uh, across cluster mesh as well. It's not there yet, but it's one of the things that we're working on. But you can define network policy that applies across, these cl uh, across clusters in this space as well. So you could say that by default, you would deny all traffic to that vault service from any cluster in the mesh, and then only allow particular applications from within a namespace or within a particular namespace to allow access to that vault service. So you can, and that would apply globally across all of the clusters. It's pretty neat stuff. Yeah, I agree. XDP is the bee's knees. So one of the questions was, can Cilium inspect UDP packets via programmatic signature signing way to drop DDS as in a la AWS Shield? I believe the capability is there. And I believe that you're gonna see a, a, you know more of an implementation of that in the future. Um, the question is really, where do we get the where do we get the source of data that we need to use to program that um, implementation, right? So like we have all of the parts and pieces necessary to do it. We just have to make sure that we have a validated source and then we build integration with sources like AWS Shield that could actually allow us to, um, to uh, configure those things somewhat more dynamically. That brings us to security. I could tell that I'm missing a font because like the layout of this is all pretty strange. So more advanced networking plugins 
provide will provide some me uh, some mechanism for network policy. And again, this is typically built on top of IP tables with the same problems that we discussed before. In fact, they actually exacerbate them. So now not only are you worried about um, uh, IP tables turn when a pod comes and goes, but you're also worried about IP tables turn when network policies are applied or, or, or ch um, changed. So Cilium imp implements a stronger idea for network policy that it's identity backed. And what that and what that means is that when we're defining uh, in that eBPF program that is attached to your network namespace, when we're defining the type, uh, you know, the the network policy that we're allowing or disallowing traffic between applications, we're able to I'd actually associate that with specifically an identity of the other application, not necessarily the IP address of that other application, but its identity itself, right? Some subset of labels that you have selected that I, that represent the identity of that of that other application. And that gives us the ability to deny or allow traffic using kind of using identity as a mechanism within that construct, which I think is actually very powerful. <clears throat> Network policy as implemented by most, th by most things have the ability to, to, to leverage network policy that at, at a layer at layer three and layer four, right? You might be able to identify um, applications or a given subnet or those sorts of things. And these are all constructs within the network policy mechanism that everybody's pretty familiar with inside of Kubernetes if you're implementing network policy at all. With Cilium, we can actually do things uh, even higher. We can do things at the application layer. So we can write network policy that allows you to allow or disallow a particular path um, at the uh, for uh, for a given between different applications, right? So we can actually implement network policy that says, you know, the front end is allowed to get the slash public um, URI path for a, for the back end, but only the front end is, right? So this is pretty amazing because it means that we're able to define network policy right up at the layer seven piece. A lot of folks, uh, there are there are others out there that are doing a similar thing, and they're leveraging mechanisms like Istio, which bring a lot of complexity to your cluster to achieve this. And we're doing this with eBPF. And because we're using eBPF like at that kernel layer, we have all of that context to rely on. So we can use that context to actually implement these sorts of mechanisms, which is pretty amazing. Um, another great example of that context, because we actually have a view of what's happening at the, uh, at the kernel layer, right? We can see for any given process, what DNS calls it's making. And that gives us the ability further extended to give us to, to allow us to define network policy that will apply to FQDNs, right? So when I see an application trying to access an FQDN, mydomain.io, I can allow or disallow that traffic based on the name, not without, without having to necessarily worry about what the IP address of that external entity is which is pretty neat stuff. And we can also use this mechanism, the same mechanism to define observability. And we'll get to that here in a second. If you wanna learn more about policies like this or kind of check out what we can do from the network policy perspective, definitely check out network policy, networkpolicy.io. There's a lot of really great content on there that show you kind of like how that piece of it works. So L3 matching capabilities. Um, this is no longer about IP addresses or limited context like that. Remember that context is king. We can define policy with whatever context is gathered from the environment or gathered from the traffic itself. And this includes pod labels, node labels, and FQDNs. And so we're having the ability to define, we're, we're, we're gaining the ability to learn like maybe from your cloud provider, what are the other instances out there? What are the services that you've been made, that you've made available to the cluster? And we can learn from those, we can learn those and define those as targets within the fabric of Cilium itself, and then give you the ability to define network policy. These pods in this particular namespace can interact with that EC2 data or with that um, uh, with that database that you spun up into the in the database service inside of AWS or your cloud provider of sort of choice. <clears throat> One of the things Eldon says is my, by far the most frustrating part of IP tables is the inability to resolve. Yeah, this is a tough one. Yeah, and we handle that for you, which I think is pretty darn pretty darn awesome. 
So we talked a lot about what we can do to route network traffic. We talked a little bit about what we can do to secure that network traffic and to secure some of the other capabilities. And now we get into like, you know, um, how do we use that context to debug or to troubleshoot or to understand what's happening within the cluster, right? What if I wanted to understand traffic between two applications or show me the traffic that's dropped or show me what the application itself is doing? Do I see an increase in errors when certain conditions happen? These are all questions that we might ask of our infrastructure. And in this age of distributed systems, these questions are pretty hard to actually answer. You know, and of course the, and the age old question, is it DNS for which the answer is always yes. So Kubernetes doesn't provide a tooling to answer any of these questions, but we're working on providing that tooling with Cilium. And the way that we're doing that is we're leveraging it and we're, we're providing that tooling in three different ways. It was for Akamai. It's always DNS though. Even when it's not DNS, it's DNS. So what is Hubble? So Hubble, we have, uh, like I said, we're providing that, that, say, that uh, we're providing access to that context that we're deriving kind of up at that kernel level in three different ways. We're providing it in a UI, we're providing it in a CLI, and we're providing Hubble metrics, which is a mechanism for exposing uh, metric data that might be related to um, the event data that we're gathering or that context that we're, that we're gathering. And the, way, and the way that we do that is that, you know, that Cilium agent that's sitting there um, with all the EBPF programs, we're gathering the context that is learned at the EBPF programs and, and, th and thrown into the file system. And then we're exposing that, we're streaming that data to a place where we can centralize it, Hubble Relay. And Hubble Relay can then make that available in one of these three different ways, including the ability to expose or to export that event data to a particular to to Elasticsearch or to an S3 bucket or to a variety of different mechanisms that you can actually make that uh, that uh, event data available offline. So here's a snapshot of a service map, but I kind of wanted to show you a live service map. I think I'm going to have to stop sharing and then share again to get this to work, but it's worth it. All right, so here's an example of some of the context that we're able to gather. What I'm showing you here is the Cilium Enterprise um, tooling that actually exposes the ability to understand contextually, not only what's happening at the network layer, but right down to the process layer. Um, and so what I've got is I've got an application that's been deployed inside of, my, in, inside of a mini cube cluster. And inside of that application, I've written a little thing that's like a cron, a cron job running inside of that container that went on a certain amount of time is actually going to call out and to a uh, to the not reverse shell.com just to kind of show us contextually what's happening at that process layer. So what we can do with this stuff is actually pretty amazing, right? So this gives us the ability to see for every given application inside of our cluster what network calls and what network connectivity is happening. So we can see that the crawler in this case is interacting with Elasticsearch. We can see that it is interacting with the, the Twitter API, basically crawling the Twitter API, looking for responses and, cat, and putting this stuff into Elasticsearch. And then we can also see, because it's like, you know what, let me actually make this a little bit bigger. I'm realizing it's kind of small. So we can also see that um, at a process level, we can see that somebody using, le leveraging the Node.js uh, piece of it, basically forked a new process into a shell and then made an NC or netcat connection to uh, a reverse shell. And this is the URI that it used to interact, it used a, a secure port, how handy for them, and they might be exfiltrating data. So with this context, I could write network policy to drop it. Now, while that would be a good thing to do, I probably should also stop this process, right? and understand what this attack service looks like. But this is a really great example for showing exactly how to understand what's happening at uh, contextually within a given process within your Kubernetes cluster. And these are capabilities of iSurveillance Enterprise product. Pretty amazing stuff. Let me jump back to my deck here. There we go. So these are the, and, and this other piece of it that I'm showing you here is the service map. So any traffic that we see moving back and forth between applications or external applications, we can surface that traffic visually describing the links between these things. 
We can also describe the actual um, URLs that each individual application is using and sort of understand like what, what, what's happening at that traffic policy level. And we have a really decent filtering mechanism so that you can actually see both the verdict, like what traffic was allowed or denied. We can see, um, we can see for a given identity, like what traffic is allowed or denied. We can see a lot of people, we can really kind of slice and dice that information dynamically in the UI, however you want. And these, and these events that are being uh, represented here in a visual form can also be exported to SIM, like I said. So you can actually see, um, so you can use this as a, a mechanism to do forensics and attacks and that sort of stuff. Pretty awesome security piece of it. So the flow, the flow visibility, this is kind of how we define kind of the um, uh, observability of network traffic itself. So you can see for each individual flow, you can see ethernet headers, you can see IP, ICMP headers, UDP and TCP ports, as you were asking about earlier, we can see the TCP flags for that particular flow. Like, is it established? Is it, is it, you know, is it acknowledged? Is it sent? What state is the is the TCP connection in? All of that is exposed directly for any layer four traffic. <clears throat> as we decide, you know, if you can define a policy that allows you to see even more context for a given application. Um, they could give us layer seven visibility for that application, right? And that gives us the ability to do things like for a given event, we can see the actual DNS calls and what the return and what the, and what the result of those DNS calls were, right? So in this particular case, we're seeing, I wanted to see what DNS traffics were, uh, what DNS calls were not resolving, like where, you know, for a given application, is uh, my you know, I have a user that's coming to me telling me that the uh, that a particular service is not able to. Uh, to um, connect to another particular service. And I wanna understand why I wanna be able to observe that problem and see it. And so here's a great example of being able to do exactly that, right? In this particular example, uh, a particular application is trying to interact with another and it's using a, a non-existent domain. So it just basically mistyped the URL that it's trying to interact with, right? And we can see very clearly from the DNS response that it's a non-existent non -existent domain. The way that we can enable this layer seven visibility is either by defining a network policy that applies to only those only those pods that we actually care to see this deep visibility on, or we can just annotate particular pods or services or um, deployments or what have you. And Hubble will actually um, inject an eBPF program that allows us to kick that traffic to uh, kind of the observability tool that gives us the ability to view at the wire like a lot more capability. So like, for example, with this layer seven of visibility, I'll be able to see things like what the response code was, what the method was, what the URL was used, what, body, what the body looks like. I can actually see quite a lot of content here. And we can do things like expose uh, in this model, say you wanted to understand you know, how many 200s or how many 400s or how many of a particular type of response we're seeing from a given application. Um, we can actually expose that just using Hubble Observe. And, Traditionally, I think a lot of this stuff has been hidden behind the complexity of a service mesh, but this is all coming from your CNI. You're not, you don't have to deploy Istio or another service mesh to be able to get this, this type of observability. You could just get this type of observability directly from that low level CNI, which is a pretty amazing thing. You don't have Jar Jar in the quadrants, so I know that it's not one. That's true, that's a good point. Um, some of the other stuff that we're working on is transparent SSL visibility. So as I said, when you decide, when you define a network policy that gives you the ability to um, forward that traffic to something that can give us kind of a deeper inspection on the packet or a deeper inspection on what's actually happening for that application, clearly anything that's encrypted all the way down to that pod may be harder for us to visualize. Now, I mean, most Kubernetes clusters, things aren't encrypted all the way down to the pod. They're only encrypted like either between nodes or they're encrypted outside the, uh, the, the definition of a service. You might encrypt right up to the load balancer and be encrypted back or right up to the ingress controller and unencrypted back. These are kind of the more common patterns inside of Kubernetes. But if you were to do that, we can actually do things leveraging Envoy, the, the, the tool that we use to actually increase our visibility into the application layer. Um, we're working on things like deferred encryption so that we can actually inject ourselves early enough in the process um, in the process with eBPF so that we can actually see that traffic before it gets encrypted, which is pretty amazing. If you want to learn more, there's a link in the slides and I'll be sharing those slides at the end of the at the end of the talk. <clears throat> 
So we talked about metrics as well, right? So we can scrape thing. Uh, this is an open metrics implementation that runs on Hubble Relay, and <clears throat> it provides a scraping endpoint for Prometheus. So when you're leveraging, if you're if you're leveraging Prometheus within your cluster already for gathering uh, information about your applications, how much CPU, memory, those sorts of things are doing, we can also share some of the contacts that we've exposed in, at a at a layer. Um, we can share some of the context that we're learning um, about your applications at a, on a Prometheus endpoint so that you can have that additional context when trying to build dashboards for given applications. This gives you the ability to see things like how many bytes per second you see, how many packets per second, how many TCP opens or closes or retransmits. Um, you, can do, you can see things like zero window events uh, on a metric level, right? So you can see that the application is pushing back because it's not able, not able to process the data fast enough. And these are all metrics that we can expose for any application within the cluster and expose that from, uh, from, from a Prometheus endpoint as part of the Cilium deployment. And a lot of this is customizable and extendable, right? So we can you know, leverage, like maybe you want to only expose metrics for the source context. You don't particularly care what the destination is. And you don't really care what the ephemeral port is for this stuff. You just want to understand like, you know, for a given application, who are we establishing connections with and, and how many drop packets and what the drop sources are and those sorts of things. This is all within the capability of the metrics that um, Cilium can expose. So the use cases that we're targeting are things like container networking. Because we're doing this at an EPPF layer, it's highly efficient and very flexible. We can handle routing, overlay, cloud provider native, depending on what, you know, leveraging EKS or AKS ENI, we can do those sorts of things. We can handle IPv4 or IPv6 traffic, we can handle NAT 4.6. We have the mechanism to do multi-cluster routing, as I described before. And we can also do things like WireGuard and IPsec encryption at a very low level. So all traffic opportunistically encrypted between nodes. Yep, yeah, it is very cool. We can do. We can handle things like service type load balancers. We can implement that as a node within your cluster, um, and we can also implement that as an external load balancer that you can configure however you want dynamically. We can replace Kube Proxy with a much more efficient mechanism to handle services within your cluster. From the security perspective, we have identity based network security, which is pretty powerful stuff. So. We can be very, we can be very, we can be very explicit about what applications are able to communicate back and forth on one another, based on the identity of that application, rather than just the IP address or even just the label set. We can do API, we can do API aware security, right? Like I said, you can define network policy that allows for particular paths inside of a URL because we're able to enforce that at the layer seven. Um, and again, DNS aware policies. We're doing a lot more with uh, the capabilities. I mean, you, if you've listened to a service mesh talk, you've realized that a lot of the things that I say that we can do with our CNI, people are going to service mesh to do. So consider whether a service mesh and the complexity of it is the thing that you need, or if really what you're just trying to do is handle things like encryption and handle things like observability, handle things like improving the security between pods. And if that's, if that's the only game you're in, then you might consider Cilium as a CNI. A lot of these folks did. Uh, Google, as I said, is using it for its data plane, DigitalOcean is by default using Cilium. There's a lot of really great folks out there leveraging Cilium today in their production environments. Uh, with that, that's what I had to show you. So thank you very much. If you want to learn more about EVPF, go to evpf.io. Register for the summit. It's coming right up. It'll be very exciting. You can go to Cilium.io to learn more about the, uh, about the open source product. You can join our Slack, Cilium.io slash Slack, which is also the eBPF one. So if you want to learn about eBPF, you can go there. Um, check out the GitHub project, give us a star, and follow us on Twitter at Cilium Project, Isovalent, and I am at Maui Lion. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Duffy. That was awesome, man. I, as I said in chat, I think I'm going to have to retire my eBPF talk. <laughs> I think I'm outclassed here. I, I, I want to see your eBPF talk. Before I, before I make any judgments, <laughs> I'll send you the recording. Yeah, uh, yeah, certainly. Thanks, uh, Dan and Duffy. A ton of great content. We'll we'll have to um, go back and and look through those slides and and get some of those things that I missed because the information was flying fast and furious. <laughs> <laughs>
Um, yep. But yeah, thanks to both of you again for coming out and sharing with our community here in Atlanta and now beyond because we're virtual. Um, another uh, call for speakers. Uh, so we're rounding, getting close to rounding out the year here, but we're always interested to build up a backlog of speakers. So if you've got a topic that's interesting to you that you would like to talk about, please reach out, let us know. Um, you can let us know through um, the meetup itself. You can let us know through Tech 404 or the Kubernetes Slack. You can let us know on our GitHub um, repo as well, where we track our meetups. Um, if you've got a topic that you would like to hear someone talk about, also please let us know. And uh, Alex and myself will try to track someone down that's an expert on that and get them to talk about it. Um, thanks again to Sales Law for sponsoring the um, Zoom uh, session here and whatnot. And we will have um, a meeting next month as well. Um, I'm not sure that we have the speakers all lined up for that just yet, um, but we'll be announcing that once we get all the information together. Um, and with that being said, we'll close things out. So thank you everybody for coming out and joining us. We'll have the notes posted, the video uploaded once it's ready and, and whatnot. And hang around if you will. We're gonna have a little bit of social time after this. So um, give us a second while we stop the recording and convert everybody over to panelists so we can all talk. See you in just a second. Thanks everybody. <laughs>